matter if the state later says you can have two or three or four. We're capped. And the thought is there might be a dispensary, and then later there might be a retailer, but there can't be three, and we want distance between them. That was what I was contemplating. When I wrote it that way, you might have different thoughts. But let's see what that sounds like. If there's already a dispensary and it changes to a hybrid retailer, no further retailer will be permitted while it remains in operation. That's how you get one. But an existing retailer may remain in operation without reverting to a pre-existing non-conforming use. So if the retailer comes in first, and then the dispensary comes along, and then it goes hybrid, OK. But if the dispensary comes in first, and then it goes hybrid, that's it. That's what this says. You might think there's a different way of doing it. I'm hoping it. Yeah. Yep. Two, no retailer or hybrid retailer may be located within one mile of the property boundary of a dispensary as measured from property boundary to property boundary at the nearest point. That's saying we don't want them next to each other. We don't want dueling Starbucks. However, if we do that, that absolutely guarantees that one of them is going to be in a commercial district in East Canada. So think about that. Because it's very hard to find a mile separation within the area that's left after these buffers in our central business district. I don't think it's possible. I don't think we'd want to, given where that would be. Commercial, you could possibly do it. But that's putting a lot of pressure on the commercial. Mm -hmm. Licensed cannabis retailers, hybrid retailers, and dispensaries are only allowed in the central business district and the commercial zone. They must be able to meet all the buffer distances contained in Article 11JF, in addition to complying with all parking and signage requirements contained in these regulations. We don't have new parking regulations for them. They have to meet the parking regulations of the zone. There are some specific signage regulations for, for cannabis that applies to any business anywhere in the state. Primary use. Retail cannabis shall be a primary and not an accessory use. That means, for example, if you have a business that sells donuts and you also would like to sell cannabis, that's not how it works. It's got to be the primary business. It's not an add-on. However, the retail function of a hybrid retailer that also sells medical marijuana may be secondary to its primary function as a dispensary without being considered an accessory use. We have no idea what the use of a hybrid retailer might be and how much that will be medical, so we're not going to impinge on that. But for the other one, if this is what you are, this is what you are. Hours of operation, I made these up, so make yours up. I looked at what our liquor stores are, these are less than that. I thought about Sunday, I thought about the three holidays that are actually in state law for liquor stores to be closed, and I closed these two. We can do more. Hours of operation, I'm suggesting 8 in the morning to 9 p.m. Monday to Saturday, and 12 p.m. to 6 on Sunday, and closed on those days. But if you think that's too much, we can come back and revisit it. I had some different thoughts on the manufacturing process because late night there is not much fun. Manufacturers and microcultivators. One, only one licensed microcultivator, food and beverage manufacturer, and product manufacturer shall be permitted under these regulations to get one of each. You don't get two micro growers, you get one. If we later decide that micro growers are going to say can, we can amend the regulations. But that's, I think, a prudent way to start. Microcultivators are limited to a maximum of, here we say it again, 15,000 square feet of warehouse space and may not expand to a grower's license. Under state law, they could have gone to 25. Under state law, a grower's license starts at 15. That's where that number comes from. Yep. I have no idea what makes for a viable business between 10 and 15,000 square feet. I'm not in that business, so I'm not going to presume to know that. The reason for setting it at 15 was to prevent it going into the realm of a grower's license and because it's taxable. Mm -hmm. Two, a microcultivator, food and beverage manufacturer, or product manufacturer is only allowed in the industrial zone. They must be able to meet all the buffer distances contained in Article 11JF. In addition, and this is where we're thinking about what if you live adjacent to that zone. If you live in the zone, that's kind of what you bought into, but what if you live adjacent to it? 
what kind of protections can we offer? And so what it says is, in addition to that, they must be able to meet all the buffer distances there. In addition, no warehouse or facility associated with cannabis cultivation, extraction, or manufacturing may be sited within 100 feet of any property boundary located within a residential, residential, agricultural, or central business. So use, use um, uh, I'm reading this. This is what you should do. On this one, you should be good. So let me let me back up because I'm losing where I was. Um, in addition, no warehouse or facility associated with cannabis cultivation, extraction, or manufacture may be sited within 100 feet of any property boundary located within a residential, residential, agricultural, or central business district as measured from the nearest edge of the warehouse or facility to the nearest point of the adjacent property. This was to try to get at people's concerns predominantly about smell. Since we did that, I have learned that the state licensing process is exacting on odor control. It is different than Massachusetts. I can't speak to Massachusetts. I know what people smell in, in Sheffield. This is in Sheffield. And so I don't know whether 100 feet is necessary. I don't know if it's adequate. It's a placeholder. Um, and I don't know if this is the only place we want to do it. We'll come back to it with the central business district. It must comply with the requirements of Article um, 11J G 4A 4 through 6. That's all of the other things that have to do with uh, toxic waste and whatnot that we just discussed. I was thinking hours of operation 7 to 7, because I was trying to think what is a reasonable hour of operation there. Others of you who live in industrial areas may have a different idea about this. Well, the plants too, so they're going to have water. Yeah. Things of that nature. So there might need to be somebody there doing things. There may have to be a, yeah. So the business plan is where we will say, I don't want trucks going in and out or any of those kinds of things. Yep. No, so this might take a little bit more thought on what actual hours of operation mean. And no. I again said 12 p.m. to 6 on Sunday, closed on those three days. But honestly, I look to you guys for guidance as to what it's like living in an industrial area where activities are going on and what would be reasonable. I don't know. This was a suggestion. Delivery and transporter businesses. These are trucks. The issue here isn't smell, really. It's trucks. Only one licensed delivery and one licensed, not licenses, transporter business may be permitted under these regulations. Um, and again, this is somebody whose job it is to take a vehicle or vehicles and go to one licensed entity, pick up stuff, and take it to another one. They could do it anywhere in the state. But let's say they want their business here. That's who we're talking about. And in the delivery, it's somebody who's licensed to go to a dispensary somewhere, pick up something, and bring it to someone in Camden or anywhere else they'd like to. But this is where they're based. We're allowed one of each. A delivery or transporter business is only allowed in the industrial zone. They must be able to meet all the buffer distances contained in Article 11 JF. In addition, no warehouse or facility associated with temporary cannabis storage may be sited within 100 feet of any property boundary located within a residential, residential agriculture or central business district as measured from the nearest edge of the warehouse or facility to the nearest point of the adjacent property. They also must comply with the requirements of Article 11 JG 4A 4. And primary use is the same. Cannabis delivery or transportation shall be a primary and not necessary use. This is not something you do in your off hours. It is not considered a home occupation either. It's a transportation business. Mm -hmm. The hours of operation here are the same as the ones I had in uh, the other things in the industrial zone. That's a draft. <coughs> it has implications. We've highlighted some of them. But just so we start collecting what people want to talk about more, and I go just around the table and see initial reactions places where people want to, want to make sure we spend more time and other kinds of conversations. And we'll just start with Pete. That sounds reasonable to me. I don't see anything that uh, throws a red flag. Um, I think when we start bringing buffers and see where it actually can go, yep. that's going to be the, the real deal. Okay. What are you thinking about? 
So going on, <coughs> why can we limit that to 10,000 square feet? Uh, I understand that we're all concerned about tax dollars here, but with increased tax dollars, I don't feel we're worth the increasing outside of the state of Connecticut. And also, transportation. Mm -hmm. So I'm a plumber by trade. Yeah. I have my employer's vehicle at my home. Mm -hmm. Um, there are times I have plumbing parts for a job that I'm doing tomorrow mm -hmm. at my own residence. How does that work out with transportation delivery service? You they can't can only do park that. It. They can only park it in an industrial area. The way I've written it. Security. That is true. Okay. Because guess what? <coughs> You're transporting a product that I don't want in your backyard. Well, th these are these are questions. Yeah. That, um, yeah. No. Exactly. Are, are, we're it's different than other businesses clear. as written. Um. We'll get back to the question about the 10,000. I, I think it is one we want to discuss. Okay. I don't want, oh, sorry, go ahead. I didn't uh, no, I just think you, this has been great. Oh, this is. Thank you. It took some work. I'm glad you did. I don't think it's perfect. I think it is something it we can is, work with. It's really something that you spend a lot of time on. I appreciate that. And once we get into the buffers. Yep. Well, well yeah, how do you feel? No, I, I think you nailed it. With Doug, how you doing? Yeah, well, then the bumpers, you know, I gave George a sketch. Of, yep. And, uh, and then on this residential on the back page, yep. I would go along 200 feet. 200? That's perfectly fine to consider different buffer widths for people in adjacent zones. Um, how are you doing? Matt, uh, oh, okay. you did a fine job. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thanks for doing the work and laying this all out. I think it looks pretty good. Um, everything seems to be in line with what we've been talking about and where we've been going with this. So we'll see if there's really anything to change. Folks in the room who has initial reactions before we dig into the implications of this one. <laughs> um, I pulled out the document from the Office of Legislative Research, which yep. is uh, an independent body from the uh, General Assembly. It's uh, municipal tax guidance for, for the Good. cannabis. Good. I'll, uh, I'll hand out a copy, but just to read on the surface, it doesn't explain how the tax is collected, okay. whether it's through the tax collector or some process that the selectmen uh, determined, but it says, retailers and micro cultivators must collect the tax from consumers at the time of sale and hold it in trust until remitted to the municipality. Okay. The law establishes a process by which the retailers and micro cultivators report their sales to the Department of Revenue Services, which in turn notifies municipalities of the tax amount due from each retailer and micro cultivator. Municipalities then invoice each applicable retailer and micro cultivator, which must remit their tax payments to each respective municipality. Late tax payments are subject to penalty of 25% of the amount due and unpaid or $250, whichever is greater plus interest at 1% per month or a fraction of a month to, uh, from the due date of the payment date. And then there's six stipulations of how they miss, how <coughs> the tax revenue goes into the general fund, yep. but we, we're beholden to six different categories of how we, how you can, spend how we can spend it. Got it. Thank you, Brian. That's extremely helpful. It's, uh, it's on the back page. Okay. So of these license types, just to reiterate, the municipal tax can be levied on retailers, of which there are three kinds, hybrid, regular, and dispensary, and on microculture. There's also a statewide cannabis tax that the state is very interested in getting itself, which is much larger, and which I suspect that process was put in place to facilitate as well, and they sort of divided it. That is really helpful, thank you. Um, other initial reactions to what you heard before we dig I into the question. Oh, go ahead. No, I'll take, I'll take anybody. Sorry, Greg. No. I just have a quick one. You had stated before about having a retail and a cultivator license. You didn't want them together, you wanted them completely separate. It wasn't a retail and cultivator that It was a retail say? and, and, and So there's the dispensary? No. The two I want a mile apart. Right. are the two entities we imagine would have a retail component. A dispensary or a hybrid dispensary 
or a retailer. You can have various combinations of two, or in one case, one. And, and I don't want them closer together than one mile in what we were. So you're talking two different places to retail? Yes. Because I was under the assumption the town only had one. Um, we have the ability to permit a retailer. We do not have a state cap at this time. The state might eventually say you can have others. What the state did say is we can have one retail and a dispensary, and we can have one cultivator. That was what we started with. What we're saying is, as far as our regulations are concerned, we can have a dispensary slash hybrid retailer. We can have a regular retailer. They can't be a mile or closer. What's the difference? Because I'm an idiot. You don't have a medical marijuana card, and you Correct. want to buy you, something. You, you, recreational. So for recreational purposes, you can go to either a recreational retailer, um, or you can go to a hybrid retailer that also has the ability to sell you medical marijuana if you have a card. An example of that is a torrent. Right. It used to be just a dispensary, which couldn't sell you recreational marijuana because we didn't have a law that allowed it. It was just for people who had a card. So I understand from people who have a card that that's actually a bit of a hardship, the stuff they want and that might be prescribed for them may not be available from the recreational source. And that's a bit of a drive. So, because we actually don't have a lot of, we don't have the ability to say to the state, Canaan's not that big of an area. I agree. What I'm saying is if you just, can you put that in one? Can we put two together? Can you put two together and not have two separate facilities in town? The only way that works as we've written it now, I and mean, it's perfectly possible to do it differently, but as it's written now, if we get a dispensary and then the dispensary converts to a hybrid, we're done. I could be convinced that we don't have to put that limitation there, but that's the way this is written. And if we get a recreational one first, we can't have a second recreational. The only thing we can get is a dispensary or a hybrid. I mean, well, my personal opinion, I don't think we need two recreationals. We I don't might. think the town's big enough that it needs to. And, and we may never see one. And the way the state is currently regulating this, I don't think we will see one in any time soon. I mean, this Right. So going through all this. Yeah. Oh, that's nothing. This. Th that's that's a this, that's a walk in the this, park this compared is, to what you have to do is, as a license. This is Canaan compared to the state. Yeah. Yeah. The state one's hard. The state one's really really hard. Um, Torrington has, I think, thirty six thousand people, and all they've got is the one they have. Mm -hmm. Two others have tried, and they can't meet the state requirements for the license. Mm -hmm. So it's worth knowing that we're not looking at a flood, and we're absolutely setting a cap here. However, it's a good point, and it's a point, if we, had, <laughs> if we had a sending and a receiving zone, right, if we had a place that was, we all agree, this is the spot to put the stuff. You put your liquor store there, you put your smoke shop there, you put all that stuff there, you put it next to the police station, you call it there, whatever you want to do, right? If, if, that's, if that was how we did zoning, then we probably would say, all right, that's our sacrificial area, we're not doing that, we're not sacrificing any of Canaan. We're looking for what's the most appropriate, least intrusive place that can accommodate sort of the minimum amount that we need. And you might be right. But then I wouldn't want to preclude, here's where it would be an issue. We could rewrite it. We could have a recreational licensed entity and then a dispensary wants to open. And we'd say, yeah, you can be a dispensary, but don't ever be a hybrid. I don't think we'd ever want to say that. That dispensary would probably close because none of the dispensaries would go with just dispensary. So because the hybrid thing exists and it has a dual function, this anticipates we might have one of each. What we do not have under these regulations are two strictly recreational entities. That's not what it says right now. But again, that's how I imagined it. Others might imagine it differently. Craig, I'm sorry. So that's a question from a, a different, um, not the dispensary or whatever issue, mm -hmm. but say with all your zones and, and your overlays, say you can put one at the laundromat. Say one goes there at the laundromat. Mm -hmm. Then, and it's clear of the 500 foot of yep. doctor's offices, daycares, and all that. It's a qualifying property. Is it now a disqualifying property for a daycare, no. doctor's office, anything like that? No, and so we also said, we also said in that case, if a daycare or doctor's office opens near it, it's a known entity with a license. Okay, I just wanted to make sure. No, I get because it. Because yes, 
and there's no